It, very good morning to you, Thursday the 2nd of November and a very big day for multiple reasons, obviously a day you've been looking forward to for a very long time. It's Super Thursday because you've got the Bank of England, which everyone is uh, eagerly anticipating what they're going to do because the first rate hike we're going to have in you know, over a decade. Uh, you've then got the tax reform plans which we could be looking at for more details and then the announcement more formally of the next Fed chair and we're going to talk about that because there's been some developments on that overnight and then the thing that makes this super 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 Thursday is this balloon here is not for me I've still got a few more years to run before I hit the big 4-0 but there is one person whose birthday it is today that is our head of trading peers turns the big four zero doesn't look a day over 39 but uh, let me let, let me go a bit let me do this and you can uh, you can check out what's going on around the amplify office at the moment <laughs> here we go we're on, we're on the move da -da -da -da. Any words of wisdom now that you've hit such a mature age, Piers, for us? Words of wisdom? Um, well, I've had my birthday present already. Uh, well, I've got two birthday presents. Um, one came last night uh, at Wembley, where Tottenham arrived at the top table of European football. And uh, the next one's coming this afternoon, actually. So I was talking to Mark. Um, uh, they can't. The start of September. They can't hear. So, P P Piers is basically <laughs> talking about his, his 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 birthday treat was Tottenham one last night. So no one wants to hear that. We'll move on. Anyway, <laughs> there is a guy in the background there as well. If I just peek over the top, it's the chap that makes everyone's life here at Amplify a little bit of a better place to be. Our best friend, Mr. Giles Gill. Also, his birthday was yesterday. So high fives. There you go. Not 40, no, not 40. He's not 40 quite yet. His actual next birthday will be 50, so it's fine. So, okay, let's get, let's get the show back on the road. Okay, let's get this out of the way. Right, okay, back to business. Let's get down to how the markets have reacted and what we're going to expect from, well, first of all, the FOMC last night. Let's start chronologically with how these events unfolded. Some of you may have stayed on last night for the FOMC and as expected, a non-event. Uh, market movement at the time of the release was, was pretty minimal. And that was because, if anything, the Fed just kind of stuck to the script. They signaled December hike is on track. And this, of course, comes the day before Trump announcing the next Fed share. Now, we're going to talk about that in a second. Um, but what the, the Fed basically were communicating is a degree of continuity. They remain on course for the December rate hike. And actually, if you were going off the Bloomberg estimate for the probability of the December rate hike, it is now at 98%. So pretty much all but priced in. Uh, the Fed actually have had a pretty good run this year, I'd say, of when they have lifted rates to the two prior occasions of getting the market uh, very well prepared in order that when that actually occurs and they do lift interest rates, there's a minimal reaction on that point alone. And it's been typically the projections that we've been looking at. But what's been the bigger development really on the, on the US side of things has been this, because this came out overnight. It was actually the Wall Street Journal which broke the story. And this was Trump is set to name Powell as the Fed chair nominee. So basically they just um, leaked out the report that Powell has been chosen and it's gonna be formalized later on today. Uh, this being uh, the probably least surprising I would say over the course of the last 10 days or so, uh, it was a bit of a toss up between, if you remember, there were kind of five candidates, went down to four, went down to three, went down to two, that being Powell or John Taylor. Uh, and now it seems that 
clarity has emerged ahead of the formal announcement. Reaction to this has been relatively contained because of the fact that I think the markets have been of the view that Powell was going to take that position, i.e. it seems the most prudent given the fact that he's um, gone through this transition of the commencement of the rate hike cycle with Janet Yellen as being a member of the FOMC. And so it makes sense then that he continues with that policy. And one, one of the things that we have seen this morning actually is a little bit of dollar strength. And you can see that in both major pairs, which are seen a little bit lower. Euro dollar uh, has, if I just bring my Euro dollar chart here, uh, has gone below that 1671 level in the futures. You can see that was a, a reference point with some of the, the range from yesterday afternoon uh, and early evening. It broke that when Europe came in this morning, came up to test and it's just continuing to edge lower now. But cable also uh, under a little bit of pressure and, and sub pivot. So why the dollar strength of this is expected? I think one of the things you've got to understand about Powell coming in and it's not so much that, you know, from, from an explanation point of view, it makes it much easier for me to uh, kind of explain it to you guys between Taylor's a very hawkish and Powell would be perceived or Yellen very dovish. But in essence, um, I did see a, a, a very good stat. And actually, Yellen will finish her term as one of the most hawkish, actually, um, one of the most hawkish Fed governors ever in terms of she's actually overseen a series of hikes, not many of them actually have. Um, and so uh, if you're looking at Powell, it's not the case that he's not going to hike. It's the case of he's going to hike next month and he's going to hike three times next year is the common belief. So uh, this is just about how hawkish it could have been if John Taylor obviously would have would have secured the position. And so Maybe this then just clarifies a little bit of the, the situation. It means the Fed can continue on this more longer term trajectory of, of a sequence of tightening of policy. If you were reading the FMC statement from last night, they have already commenced then this um, balance sheet tightening um, in regards to the, this incremental approach to stop reinvesting all the proceeds from their expiring bonds. And so the, the tightening is well underway and that will continue. Coupled that then with some progression on the tax front in terms of the talks, and we're looking out for more of that later today uh, in particular. Um, the latest on the tax front is that um, as per Republican lawmakers involved in the discussions, the tax bill will impose a one-time tax of 12% on U.S. companies' accumulated offshore earnings held as cash. If you remember, this was one of the, the key kind of staples of that plan, given the likes of big tech names in particular, in the likes of Ireland as a tax haven in Europe, lots of cash sitting offshore, the one-off repatriation effect that that would have if there was to be a, a very low uh, tax rate of 12% against the existing 35% would cause a big flush of money back into the US economy. Um, not only that, obviously we're talking about this gradual phase-in of tax cuts over a five-year period, taking it from 35 down to 20%. By 2022 um, so that's well on underway that should be uh, a net benefit if that does make some headway then with the confirmation of Powell economic data this week cements this improving economic argument in the US consumer confidence 17 year high um, other data has been particularly strong and obviously we look for non farms tomorrow so uh, everything is remaining uh, on that side, uh, quite positive for the for the dollar, so it might explain, I think, a little bit of the, the strength seen this morning. Okay, just having a look at some of the other things uh, that are on the agenda, in terms of timings on the formal announcement from Trump um, on when he's going to announce the Federal Reserve Chair, 3 p.m. Eastern. So obviously the time difference is shortened because of the clock change so this is actually going to be 7 p.m london time when you're going to hear um, from the rose garden when he announces now it's wall street journal that has said that powell is the person that's already been chosen now this hasn't formally come from the president as yet so one thing i'm asking myself is could there still be a surprise i'm sure that there could be um, in regards to uh, John Taylor still with a potential shot. So 
we'll see. Definitely, if that was to materialise, that would be a very big surprise, given now the market is positioned for Powell. OK, before we move on then, let's have a talk about the main event, which is the Bank of England, of course. And so, with the Bank of England, we are about to see potentially the first rate hike in a very long time. Can anyone tell me how many days ago it was when we last had an interest rate hike in the UK? Let's have your guesses in the chat room. I'm not going to make it easy with years or months. How many days was it since we last had an interest rate hike from the Bank of England? Okay, you guys are pretty good actually. Some pretty good guesses. Okay, got a couple of shouts from the floor. Okay, so uh, it's uh, pleasing to see that uh, with age comes great wisdom because Piers just shout shouted out the closest guess. Um, and then with age also comes wisdom in the, in the case of Giles because he copied what Piers said. <laughs> So they both went for 3,750, and the answer was 3,773. So the last interest rate hike from the Bank of England, let me show you the, the charts here, was on the 5th of July of 2007. So 5th of July of 2007 was the last time interest rates uh, were hiked, you can see here. If you look back on this chart, I mean, this is going back a hundred years, check out interest rates back in the 70s. Uh, I know some of you, well, maybe a minority of you might remember that. Uh, interest rates knocking plus 17% at that point. If you remember the mid 70s, high degree of political uncertainty. That was when government was changing hands pretty much every other week. Inflation driven oil shock as well during the 1970s. Um, not that I was around at that point. <laughs> but uh, let's have a look at what we're looking at from the Bank of England. And this is quite an interesting graphic that I saw. And this is mapping the yield on two year gilts. So, gilts being uh, the fixed income instrument in the UK, representative of the bond kind of uh, maturity curve. So, this is the two year, so slightly more in the shorter end which tends to be more interest rate sensitive. And what this is showing you really is a, is a story of how the Bank of England have, have carved out this expectation through communication and how it's influenced the market into thinking that they're going to deliver uh, the first rate hike in, as we said, in well over 10 years. So really this started back in June, a surprise increase in the MPC members in favor of a hike. Really this ramped up a lot more recently because through September, this is when we started to get some of those data points about uh, pickups in UK inflation. Uh, you also had the uh, commentary from the mid-September Bank of England meeting change quite substantially about removal uh, of stimulus in the coming months. And then GDP has come out better than expected. And basically yields have risen to this point of where we are at the moment. Now, in terms of market pricing for the Bank of England hike, it stands at 90%, 9-0. Of 60 economists surveyed, I've just checked this morning, across all major banks, only eight are going for a hold. So the other 52 all anticipating a hike later. Now, if that then doesn't happen, one would think that this yield needs to collapse all the way back down uh, quite substantially. But as we're going to discuss here, this isn't just about hike or no hike. There is actually a fairly, uh, it's going to be a fairly complex release because it's, there's a lot of different points that we're going to need to monitor to trade this effectively. So I didn't want to go into the full briefing. I'm going to pop, to, uh, pop a link into the chat room afterwards that I did yesterday, which is a more thorough overview of what to expect today from the Bank of England. But in summary, there's a couple things to look out for and I'll quickly recap it. One is, I've kind of broke it down into five distinct parts. Hike or no hike, 
That's the first and foremost reaction you're probably most likely to see. And if you think about what's going to be the bigger reaction, given the 90% positioning of how the market's priced, obviously if they don't hike, there's going to be an immediate spike on the downside in terms of the pound. Now, beyond that then, what will dictate how big that spike is, is the composition of the vote split. Now, let's say that they do hike. I would say that 9-0 is the most hawkish but least probable. Uh, I would say that given the, the language, certainly that we've heard from Cunliffe and Ramsden in particular, I think that it isn't going to be unanimous. And so actually, probably if, it, if that was the case, we might get just a flip reverse of what we normally have. And instead of a 7-2 hole, we get a 7-2 hike with those two actually saying, no, we shouldn't be doing any, uh, any policy tightening at this point. The point being is that it could be a, an extremely close call. Let's say, hypothetically, we get a 5-4 to hike, i.e. just over by one. What you might see is after this initial reaction to hike, the pound might see a bit of a pop, but then given it's a very close call, it might start to temper some of that gain. If we did get 9-0, then the pound's going to continue to, to accelerate at that point. Beyond that, we've also got the minutes, of course, uh, and particular prevalence to the discussion on inflation and growth. You've also got the quarterly inflation report. This is what makes uh, today also, it kind of enhances the probability of them potentially hiking because they then get the transparency of looking out to their two-year forecasting through the QIR. And then you get the press conference with Mark Carney. So if he does hike, obviously he has the ability to then look to try to tame any um, far-reaching market movement by the fact that he can um, deliver a statement, take questions with the audience in attendance as well. So to look to explain his decision making. And I'm sure that if, um, if he does hike and if it was um, quite, uh, quite a big tilt towards hiking in terms of the vote split, then I'm sure he'll be very mindful of wanting to just um, temper any expectations that this is going to be the one of a sequence of hikes. Because I think one of the big things here, and if we go back to the interest rate chart, that most people I've been talking to is about a removal of the emergency hike that was delivered in the summer of last year after the referendum. So if you look at this chart, we, we've gone zero, we've been at 0.5% for an extended period. We cut after the referendum. And so today's one is just taking that back. Um, whether this would be a beginning of a sequence of hikes, I very much doubt it. So the sequence of execution, just to summarize, Hike or no hike would be the first reaction that, that probably how the, the market will react to this information. Then the composition of the vote split and if they hike by how much. The opposite would be if they held, obviously that pound would fall, but then if it falls further, obviously if it remained at 7-2, that would be incredibly dovish likelihood it probably wouldn't. It's going to be a much closer run race than that. The tone of the minutes is key. Uh, in combination with the projections from the QIR because we're going to probably see inflation forecasts upgraded because inflation obviously is tracking now at 3% core inflation, the highest in about six years in the UK. It's going to need to be revised because the previous quarterly inflation report came out in August, which was some time ago. Inflationary conditions have persisted since then. And then the press conference. And one of the things I'll put into the chat room later is the Periscope feed and we'll look to, to monitor that live obviously when he begins. So uh, points one to four will all come out at midday. Point five will come out at half past 12. So that's kind of the setup. Again, I'll put the link in if you want to. I'll go through it in more detail uh, in the briefing I did last night. So if you want to rewatch that. But looking at how the pound might react uh, let's look at it on a much larger time frame. Um, one of the things is I think the initial reaction is going to be incredibly volatile. Um, I just think that the complexity of the fact that the kind of binary uh, algo pop that you'll get on the back of whether they do it or don't, and then you're going to have to, there's a sliding scale of potential reaction on the, the vote split itself, 
then picking the bones of the minutes and the QIR. So it's going to be a few minutes before potentially you might get presented with an opportunity uh, in that respect. Now, um, looking on if, we, if they don't hike, let's say, where could the pound go to from here? And I would say looking on the downside, that 131.50 and then beyond to that initial, this was the Tory party conference. If you remember that happened, that would, took place between the 1st and the 4th of October. And that is, if I highlight it, that section there, that was when Theresa May had her coughing fit and loss of voice. Uh, and certainly a lot of question marks about her leadership at that point. We hit a eventual low down at 130.59 in the futures, that being the high back in late June and also mid-May. Uh, definitely that could come in, but you've got to understand that if they are going to be, if they're not going to hike, they're probably going to sound incredibly hawkish in order to maintain credibility. So although you might get a flash large move to the downside, actually I think you might just come all the way back to where it was. Um, in terms of the next opportunity really for the Bank of England to hike though, that's probably not going to come until February, which is their next QIR. If they hike, and let's say they sound quite hawkish because they want to show uh, a kind of forceful hand on the inflation front and maintain credibility that they've got control on the situation. So if you have a hike, it's a fairly comprehensive, let's say a 7-2 split to do so, and they're hawkish in their um, commentary, and then definitely a push up towards this 135, which is kind of the, the high bound of the range post immediate EU referendum on the left hand side of this chart here, uh, back in July, and then also the retest in early September. Uh, I don't think that can be off the cards in that kind of setup. The main thing is, um, as I always say, understand and plan for every eventuality. Those who uh, know the famous World Cup rugby coach Clive Woodward, you got to do your teacup. Always plan for the unexpected, so when it occurs you are full and ready to action and execute under those conditions and under pressure. Okay, so a few other things we've got to quickly cover for you. Um, this is something that I saw last night, but I just thought I'd keep you up to speed. Not a lot of people really looking at oil right now because of the Bank of England, the tax reform, the Fed chair. But certainly um, this is continuing the exact line of what we've really heard from the Saudis and Russia. This was a Gulf OPEC source last night. OPEC is likely to stay the course by keeping its current curb on oil production in place for the whole of 2018 despite potential output disruptions next year. So uh, obviously it's the 30th of November. That's the next scheduled OPEC meeting in Vienna. And so again, much like a central bank, they're kind of prepping up the market for um, expectations of what it is they're going to do. And although oil saw a pretty big drop yesterday, looking in the grander scheme of things, it's this kind type of commentary, which is the reason why we've managed to test up to year-to-date highs at this $55 handle. Uh, you can see here we found a bit of resistance yesterday. I think we had a flurry up to around 55.22 or so in the futures, if I remember yesterday. Uh, and that obviously takes us all the way back to the end of 2016, beginning of 2017. So an interesting level that's held thus far, uh, but this really big rise that we've had really more recently since the beginning of the month, or I should say October, uh, all on the premise of a continuation of this rhetoric that OPEC stand ready to do uh, considerably l l more on the duration front. Uh, but if you look at oil at the moment, we are, let's just flick back to the chart, at session lows. And so looking at the downside, I'd just be keeping an eye on this $54 handle that's coming into sight now. And then you've got the low from yesterday, uh, just when Europe was kind of exiting the market. That was down at 53.89. Uh, there hasn't otherwise been any new information. I'd say there's probably more byproduct of the dollar, which has been moving higher since Europe has stepped in. Okay. Finally, you've had a number of corporate earnings this morning, and I just wanted to give you the kind of percentages because I think that really tells the story because these markets cash-wise have been open for about an hour now. Uh, but Royal Dutch Shell beat analyst expectations for Q3 
reporting roughly a 50% rise in underlying net profit at Shell. Um, but keep in mind, we've had most of the other oil majors have already reported, Exxon, Chevron in the States, BP's already done earlier in the week, and so they've all been excellent earning reports, and so the market's kind of factored this in. Shell shares were only up about a percent on the back of it, um, but again, a 50% rise in underlying profit. Other notable movers that are earnings related, uh, just to give you a bit of a summary, I think we had Tate and Lyle up about 4%, BT Group up 3%. On the flip side though, um, the diabetes arm, which is very influential for the profitability of Sanofi Aventis, which is one of the biggest firms in the Cap Courant, uh, they were down 2.5% in terms of that French pharmaceutical company. So. Uh, they were a bit of a weak spot. Some of the FTSE names that have reported a little bit better today. Okay, looking at the, the calendar to wrap things up, we have had the manufacturing PMIs coming out for the uh, Eurozone. These are a day later than normal, just owing to the fact that we had a holiday at the beginning of the week uh, in some parts of Europe. We've just had the German unemployment change come out. Uh, just to give you that number. It came in, just looking on unemployment rate, 5.6% looks to be in line. Uh, the German unemployment change, just picking out of Twitter, minus 1.1 thousand, estimated was for minus 10 thousand. Uh, I don't think this data is going to have too much of an influence. The PMI manufacturing numbers were uh, the revisions, so they've seen minor uh, impact as well on the underlying market price so far this morning. Uh, looking further forward, before the Bank of England, you do have the construction PMI. So we'll look out for the service PMI actually tomorrow uh, for the UK. Um, but in the interim period, uh, you've got the rest of the Eurozone um, manufacturing PMIs coming out in the next few minutes. Bank of England then the main event at midday, followed by the press conference at 12.30. US-wise, we've got the re weekly jobless claims at 12.30. Uh, again, the US clocks will change this weekend. And quite interestingly, ahead of what we said, Trump is going to unveil the Fed chair uh, at 7 p.m. London time. Fed's Powell actually does speak today, participating in an alternative reference rates committee. That'll be at 12.30 London time. So it'll be quite interesting to see uh, if anything comes of that speech. Uh, so that's it. So have a good day. Good luck if you're trading the main event, the Bank of England. Uh, obviously, I'll, I'll be around to cover that in full as well. Uh, to supplement the squawk, some further analysis at the time. And a happy birthday to Piers and Giles. Thank you. And good luck for today. Thank you.